to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do want to encourage you, as you make your travel plans, remember to go to johnnydollarair.com. JohnnyDollarAir.com is a Priceline affiliate link uh, where you can get all of the benefits of going through Priceline.com, but part of the purchase price supports the great detectives of old-time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making your travel plans, check JohnnyDollarAir.com first. Well, now it is time for us to get into this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date is November the 3rd of 1953, and the title is The Gino Gamboa Matter. WBBM-FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Roger Stern, Dollar. Oh, hello, Mr. Stern. Got a job for you. Fine. Our company insures a Mr. Barney Rico. Oh, I know that name. Used to be pretty big in the rackets, wasn't he? Yeah, for the past seven years, he's been Mr. A number one citizen. Our company insured his life for 100000 He was killed yesterday. How? He was murdered. See Lieutenant Briggs at the 7th Precinct. He'll give you the details. Right. Briggs is an old friend. When can you leave? As soon as I pack a bag. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Intercontinental Bonding and Indemnity, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Gino Gambona matter. Expense account item one, $24.98, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at Grand Central, went directly to the hotel where I registered and called Lieutenant Arthur Briggs. I caught him on his way to lunch. He agreed to meet me in a small restaurant across from the precinct. Well, good to see you again, Johnny. Well, good to see you, Art. It's been a long time. Investigating the Rico killing, eh? Yeah. Why don't we order, and then you can tell me about it. Well, I know what I want. This is corned beef day. Good corned beef, real lean. Oh, that sounds Nancy? fine. Nancy? I'll be right there, Art. How much is Rico insured for? 100000 The brother's the beneficiary. Uh-huh. Any idea who killed him? No, not yet. It's always tough when a guy's been in the rackets, even if he's gone straight for a while. He used to be with a Gambona outfit, wasn't he? Yeah, you know how that Hi, much. Art. Well, hello, beautiful. Corn beef? Yeah, two. Coffee? Yeah, Johnny? Yeah, coffee. Two beefs, two coffee, salad or soup? Just the corn beef for me. Yeah, I don't want the salad or the soup. Sir, you putting on weight? You kidding? No, you're getting a little... I'm on a diet. Are you kidding? Well, just asked. I don't mind. Gee, that's going to make all the difference in the world. I still love it. All of big fat me? Gee. <laughs> She's cute, man. Yeah, sure is. 
Yeah, well, getting back to Rico. As I was saying, I'm sure you know it. Any time a guy like Rico gets killed, it's tough to come up with the answer. Could be any one of a dozen guys he was in the rackets with. You remember him at all? Yeah, he was the one who testified against Gambona. That's right. His testimony sent Gambona back to Sicily. Could have been any one of Gambona's mob. It's just been waiting for the chance. I don't know whether you remember or not, but at the trial, Gambona made it plenty clear that he'd get Rico sooner or later. What's happened to Gambona? He's still in Sicily. Rico did pretty well for himself after he went straight. Yeah, he did fine. Opened a string of barber shops, built himself a nice home. The brother's name is uh, Dave. Yeah, he manages the shops. What did he have to say? Well, he's scared stiff. He didn't have anything to do with sending Gambona to Sicily, but he was in the outfit and pulled out when his brother did. He's in a panic. He hasn't got any idea who killed Barney? Well, if he does, he isn't saying, and I can't say I blame him. Well, after lunch, I think I'll have a talk with Dave. He's probably at the main shop or at home. Here you are. Well, thanks, beautiful. Lean enough for you? Looks great. Well, I'm glad something around here hasn't got too much fat on it. Expense account item two, $3.55, lunch for Lieutenant Briggs and myself. After which, Briggs gave me Dave Rico's home and business address, and I left. Expense account item three, $1.45, cab fare to Dave Rico's home, where I talked with his wife. She informed me that her husband hadn't returned from work yet and suggested I go to the main barber shop of the Rico chain. Expense account item four, $1.65, more cab fare from the Rico house to the barber shop on East 118th Street. It was after six when I arrived and the shop was closed. The interior was dark except for a light coming from a back room. I knocked on the door and waited. I was about to leave when I saw the figure of a man stagger into the darkened shop from the lighted back room. He stood for a moment framed in the doorway, one hand clutching his stomach. I banged on the door again and watched as the man pushed himself away from the door jam and started across the shop. Halfway to the front door, he slumped to the floor and lay still. I stepped back, kicked the glass out near the door lock, reached in and opened the door. But by the time I got to the man's side, he was dying in a hurry. Uh, call, call a doctor, quick. Yeah, yeah, sure. Who did it? Gumbo. He died looking up at the ceiling and holding his stomach where a knife had cut him almost in two. It was Dave Rico, and he'd named Gambona as his killer. I called Lieutenant Briggs. Gambona? That's what he said. I asked him who did it, and he said Gambona. Well, that's crazy. Why? Gino Gambona's in Sicily. You sure? Well, sure, I'm sure. Authorities over there keep a close check. Maybe he meant Gambona's mob. A lot of them still around. Well, wouldn't he know them? Yeah, he'd know them. But he said Gambona. Well, I'll get a cable off to the authorities in Sicily. In the meantime, what if Gambona is in town? If he is, he's going to have a hard time getting back out. But... A lot of people would hide him. I'll, uh, I'll start checking right away. See you, Johnny. The coroner's deputy arrived, followed by the lab boys, and I went back down to the precinct. Briggs made his report to the chief, and a cable was sent to the proper authorities in Sicily. For the next few hours, we went through the mugs and picked out all of Gambona's former associates that were still in town. One of them was a girl. Virginia Barrett. Used to be a steady thing with Gambona, wasn't she? Yeah. She's been a good girl, though. Got a job and stayed out of trouble. Well, worth checking. She sings. Not very good, but the joint she sings in doesn't expect anything great. Where is it? It's over on 34th Street. I've been in it a couple of times. What's the name of the place? Something Den. Pirate's Den, yeah. You gonna be busy for a while? Yeah. You want to say hello to Ginny? Yeah, I thought I might. Well, let me know how you make out. Sure. If I run into Gambona, I'll give him your regards. Yes, sir. Do that. Expense account item five. A dollar and seventy-five cents for still another cab from the precinct to East 34th Street in the Pirate's Den. It was a small place set down below the level of the sidewalk and filled with enough smoke to keep the walls from falling in. I found a table near the back of the room and gave my order to a swollen-eyed waiter that looked like he'd been mixing salad on his apron. 
When I told him I'd like to talk to Virginia Barrett, he gave me a long look and then wandered off through the smoke. About five minutes later, Virginia Barrett appeared, cased me for a second, and then swayed her way to my table. You wanted to see me? Yeah. Won't you sit down? After you tell me what you wanted to see me about. It's a personal matter. I'll preface it with a drink. No. You a cop? No. I'm thirsty, but I'm even more inquisitive. Heard from Gino Gambona lately? <laughs> Who are you? Johnny Dollar. Should I know you? No. Well, do you have to drink? Right. Now, what's all this about Gino Gambona? Have you seen him lately? You kidding? I'll say it another way. Have you seen him lately? Look, Gino got sent to Sicily a long time ago. I haven't been out of New York since the day I was born. Okay. But have you seen him lately? Look, mister, I just told you. I haven't seen Gino since the day he waved goodbye from Pier 47. I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. You read about Barney Rico getting killed the other day? Dave Rico was killed this evening. That's too bad. Before Dave died, he named Gambona. You knew the Rico boys, didn't you? Long time ago. Now you'll have to excuse me. I go on in a minute. I'll wait. Okay, but don't hold your breath. She walked away looking worried and disappeared through a door on the opposite side of the room. I took a beat, then got up and crossed the room to the door and entered. On the other side, I found a small, dimly lit hall, and a rather large, muscle-bound man walked toward me. You looking for something? Yeah. I think you got the wrong view. I'm looking for Miss Barrett. Look in the other room. I have. Try again. Where'd Virginia Barrett go? She's probably in her dressing room, but that doesn't make any difference to you. Oh, you're wrong. Uh Uh-uh. Now turn around and walk back in that room while you got the strength left. Get out of my way. Just like that, huh? Exactly. Okay. Friend, if anyone offers you a job as a bouncer, forget it. I left him lying in a corner and went down the hall, looking on the other side of doors for Virginia Barrett. But Virginia Barrett was somewhere else. I ran out into the alley behind the club just in time to see her climb into a cab on the other side of the street and pull away. Expense account item six. A dollar twenty-five for another cab. We followed Virginia to a large apartment house on the west side of town. We parked a half block away. I watched her go in, then I followed. I went up the front steps of the building and looked at the mailboxes. Virginia Barrett's apartment was 203, but the front door had a night latch on it. I picked a name on a box... A Miss Adelaide Jones and buzzed it. Yes? Uh, Miss Jones? Yes, who is it? Uh, flowers. Flowers? From the Ashley Florist. Flowers? The gentleman wanted them delivered immediately. Oh, really? Oh, wait a minute. Well, I was in. I found apartment 203 and started to knock. But sometimes when you get impatient, you get careless. I tailed Virginia Barrett, but I'd forgotten about the big boy I'd left sleeping it off in the back hall of the pirate's den. Obviously, he knew where Virginia could be found, and obviously, when he came to, he'd hurried right over. Because when I raised my hand to knock, the big boy barged up the stairs and pointed his gun right at my dinner. Hold it. Oh, why, sure. You're a busy little fellow, aren't you? I have to be, or I lose the game. Yeah? It's a treasure hunt. I have to bring back a pound of three-day-old rhubarb, the lapels are three opera capes and uh, a dozen assorted heads. I'd like to contribute. Well, every little bit helps. I can guarantee some broken bones. Now, about Gino Gambona. You never can tell. Go ahead and knock. Who is it? Marco. Well, good evening. What's he doing here? Go on, get in there. Found him in the hall. Give me some trouble over at the club. He says he's not a cop. Who is it? That guy I was telling you about. Marco's with him. Well. Well, what? That's about all I can come up with. Your name's Dollar? Yeah. You know me? Yeah. Your name is Gino Gambona. Friends, Wrigley's 
Reese's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work, and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Gino Gambona stood in the middle of the room looking at me with a nasty smile as though he'd just come up with a particularly funny way to kill me. Gino Gambona, one-time lord of the underworld. By all rights, he should have been in Sicily where the United States government had sent him for the rest of his life. But there he was. And there I was, wishing he wasn't. The big man Virginia Barrett had called Marco, shoved his gun in my spine, and prodded me over to an uncomfortable chair. Gambona held the nasty smile and walked slowly over to me. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. Well, the, the, the name don't mean nothing. Who are you? I'm a special investigator for an insurance company. We hold a policy on the late Barney Rico. Mm-hmm. His beneficiary was his brother. I don't know who insured him. Well, it looks like your company don't have to pay off to nobody. Looks that way, doesn't it? Tell me, uh, Johnny Dollar, how much uh, insurance you got? Just a small policy. I'm expendable. <laughs> I'm glad. Dave Rico named you before he died. Oh, really? Oh, were you the guy pounding on the front door of his shop? What did you kill Dave for? I thought you just wanted Barney. Well, Dave's last name was Rico. But now, about you, Dollar. What am I going to do about you? Well, I could make a few suggestions, but I don't think you'd go for them. No, 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 no. I don't think so. Whatever it is, boss, let me, huh? Mm -hmm. You got pushed around a little, eh, Marco? I'll make up for it. Mm -hmm. You know, Dollar, it ain't uh, like the old days. Marco was one of my boys in the old days. On his toes then. You couldn't have pushed him around then. Did you come all the way back here just to kill Barney Rico? No, 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 no. Of course not. I had something to get. And I couldn't trust nobody to get it for me. Not even my... <laughs> my little baby here. Uh, you, uh, you met Virginia, Dollar? Mm, briefly. And I, uh... I hear she's a, she's a singer now. You hear her sing? Let's stop playing around, Gino. Mr. Gambona. Nobody calls me Gino, unless I like him. The police know you're in the States. Mm-hmm. They sent a cable to Sicily. Well, they ain't going to find out nothing that way. I got it all fixed. By the time they really go looking for me, I'll be back like uh, I never left. And who's going to say they saw me here? Bonnie Rico? Dave Rico? You? Gino, let's get this over with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Marco. Cool this bum off. Take him for a drive down by the river. Sure. What about the stuff? Well, me and Jeannie will pick it up and meet you. Now, get going. Get up. Well, hmm. it was a nice meeting you, Dollar. Charmed, I'm sure. Come on. Move. <laughs> Marco followed me out of the room and we started down the stairs. Suddenly, on the upper landing, the most beautiful distraction I'd ever seen shouted... Hey, you! And Marco turned his head for just a second. Oh! Oh, my goodness! Thanks. He had a gun! Yeah, he sure did. Gosh, I don't know what's going on here. I... 
I thought for a minute you had some flowers for me. Someone called from downstairs and said he had some flowers for me. Uh, you seen anyone with some flowers? No, honey, but I'm personally going to buy you a whole acre of orchids. I went back to Virginia Barrett's apartment, but Gino and Virginia had left a few steps ahead of me. I looked out of the window and saw a car pull away. Then I picked up the phone and called Lieutenant Briggs. Marco came, too, on the way to the precinct. And after we arrived, Briggs booked him and took him downstairs to the interrogation room. Where were you supposed to meet Gambona? I wasn't. What was the stuff he was going to pick up? You tell me. Two men have been killed, Marco. Not that I know of. You were supposed to meet Gambona. Was I? He said so. I must not have heard him. I'm going to put two men on you every two hours. We won't get tired, but you're going to be miserable. I know the route. Where can we find him? You hear me, Marco? I hear you. Where can we find him? I don't know. Where are you supposed to meet him? I'm not. When did you get into town? I don't know. When did he contact you? He didn't. You're a liar. If you say so. How did you know where he was staying? He says I did. Where were you when Barney Rico was killed? When was he killed? The morning of the 3rd. I was at home. You sure? Yeah. Where were you the morning of the 4th? I don't remember. What's that got to do with That's it? That's when Barney was killed. You said the 3rd. Did I? It was the 4th. Where were you? At home. You said you didn't know. I was at home. Both mornings? Yeah. Cigarette? Yeah, thanks. Marco? Yeah. Know anyone who can prove you were home the morning of the 4th? No. Where were you this evening? When this evening? All evening. From about 5 o'clock on. I was at the cafe. What do you do there? Look, what is all this? I don't know anything about the Rico killing. Somebody does. If we don't get Gambona, I'm going to have someone for these killings. But it wasn't me. Then give us an alibi. I told you. Did anyone see you? Oh, no, I told you I was at my place. You said you were at the club. That was this evening. What about the morning of the 3rd? You said the 4th. I said the 3rd. At home. And the 4th. Yeah, yeah. At first you said you didn't know. Now, wait a minute. Lay off. What do you want to know? Where we can pick up Gambona. Get his cigarette. Where were you supposed to meet him? Okay. Nuts to Gambona. Nuts to the ten grand. I'm bushed. I can't think anymore. What ten grand? Ten grand Gambona promised me for helping him get in and out of the States. Where is he going to get ten grand? He's at a stash somewhere. Where? I don't know. So help me. Even Virginia didn't know. Is she going with him? Yeah. Gino said he'd come back and get Virginia and the dough. He must have a bundle hidden somewhere. When's Gambona leaving? I don't know. Don't lie to me. You said you were getting paid to get him in and out of the country. That's right, but I haven't made arrangements to get him out yet. You were going to meet them. Where? Grand Central, by the Oyster Bar, 11.30. Now can I relax, get some rest? We got to the Oyster Bar in ten minutes and Briggs had stakeouts placed around the entire area. At 11.30, Virginia Barrett and Gino Gambona failed to show. We waited for another hour. Mr. William James, report to the information desk. Mr. William James. Where till I get back to Marco? Well, the only reason he'd lie is to give Gambona and the girl enough time to get away. Yeah, well, they'll never make it. They've got everything covered. Marco's job was to get them out. If he thinks they've got a chance to make it, he must have already made the arrangements. Yeah, but what kind? Well, we can forget about planes. Take a pretty big ship to go that far. What about some obscure boat? Yeah, yeah, that could be a big payoff to the captain. Look, we can figure Gambona got here within the last week. He couldn't afford to be gone too long from Sicily. He told me he's got it fixed and nobody will miss him, but he couldn't be gone too long. Uh, take him two weeks both ways by boat. Yeah. He must have planned it to arrive here, get the money and his girl, take care of the Ricos and get out fast. Let's check the boats that arrive from Italy and Sicily in the last two or three days and see if one of them is sailing tonight. Right. We checked the arrivals for the past week and then compared them with current departures. We found one looked like it could be it. 
An independent steamer, the Atlantic Star, had arrived from Sicily the morning of the 3rd, the day before Barney Rico had met his death, and was due to sail from Pier 16 at 1 o'clock in the morning, bound for the Mediterranean. We piled into a squad car and arrived at Pier 16 at 12.50, where we identified ourselves to the gangway watch and were directed to the captain on the bridge of the Atlantic Star. Hey, hey, what are you two you guys doing? Well, yeah, what do you want? Police, you're under arrest. For what? Where are Gino Gambone and Virginia Barrett? Who? Your boat's surrounded. You might as well tell us. Yeah, stateroom B. But right now, he's probably in the galley. What's he doing there? Well, that's the way he signed on. Cook. Does pretty good at it, too. We took the captain down on deck and Briggs waved one of his men aboard. The captain was taken off quietly, then Briggs and I moved on to stateroom B. Who is it? Marco! Were you sure to... Oh! Let go of me! Take your hands off me! Now calm down, Jenny. One yell out of you and I'll fix it so you don't get to sing with the prison band. Virginia Barrett went off just as quietly as the captain, and the boat was cleared except for anyone who still might be in the galley. Briggs waited outside the galley door, and I went in, with my hand on the thirty-eight in my pocket. I spotted Gambona behind a long table stacked with pots and pans. He looked up as I moved in on him. Hey, what time is this tub supposed to pull out? It's up. To... Hello, Gino. Why, you... <laughs> Sometimes I'm so smart it gets hysterical. There I was, face to face with Gino Gambona, ready to take him, single-handed, right where I wanted him. And the next minute I was buried under a pile of pots and pans. Gino drew his gun, made a dash for the passageway. And that was as far as he got. Johnny? What? <laughs> Here, give me your hand. What happened? Somebody goofed. Gambona was dead. Virginia Barrett and Marco, full name Marco Dandoy, got five to ten years for their parts in the crime. The captain of the Atlantic Star got two years, and Lieutenant Briggs got a promotion. Yours truly returned to Adelaide Jones with the flowers he'd promised her, and all in all, everyone got just what was coming to them. Expense account item 7, $52.88 hotel bill. Item 8, $24.56. Train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $112.07. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Peter Leeds, John McIntyre, Virginia Gregg, Jay Novello, Jeanette Nolan, and Clayton Post. 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. A fairly common plot. I've uh, heard it on radio programs, and I'd also seen it on television programs of the era. Where the government has taken action to deport mafia figures to their home country and region, usually Italy or Sicily in particular. But you're dealing with very resourceful men. And so the idea that they could decide that even though they've been deported, they're going to come back for their own purposes is not at all far-fetched. So I think that in most cases it'd be uh, unlikely because many of these mafia bosses would have connections in the United States. So they would communicate through back channels to get what they needed. Uh, the problem for Gino Gamboa is that his influence was kind of in de decline from what we heard in the episode. And so he did not have top-notch trustworthy henchmen to do this task that he needed done. And so he has got to return and take a lot of risk that he wouldn't normally take. But I, I did like how Blake Edwards thought it out and made it a bit more plausible. Now, a bit of a personal update, as I promised on Monday, about how everyone's doing, and and the baby, and all that good stuff. So, our son Elijah Joshua was born on February 24th, a week to the day after the uh, last episode that I recorded, that uh, Casey Crime Photographer episode that we played on a Saturday. I won't go into too much details, but I will say this. During our all of the uh, pregnancy education courses we took, we were assured that we needed to put aside any of the stereotypes we had seen in movies and television. Things were different. It was not going to be a situation where water broke in the middle of the night and a befuddled uh, father runs around, struggles with bags, forgets things, makes stupid mistakes, but things come out all for the best in the end. That sort of cheesy stereotypical thing was not going to happen. Uh, that is pretty much exactly what happened. We had a detailed, drawn-up, pregnancy plan, and essentially none of it worked out quite how we intended for various reasons. But the important thing is that my wife did a superb job, and our son was born healthy. So a bit smaller than everyone had been planning because he came just a bit shy of 38 weeks. So we had to scramble a bit to get clothes that fit him comfortably. Oh, so he's been growing, gaining weight, and in some ways it's a pretty sprawling baby. And we're just amazed at how quickly it's happened in the eight weeks he's been home. It's still a struggle to, you know, adjust to, you know, some of the little luxuries that you lose, like sleep. But we're doing fine for the most part, and I really appreciate everyone's uh, well wishes, had my mom and brother come out for a visit uh, back uh, uh, towards the end of March, and they uh, loved getting to see him. And my mom just uh, absolutely adores him. If she didn't live like uh, 400 some miles away, she'd be over here every day, I'm sure. That week, we also planted a new tree in the backyard, an autumn blaze maple. And we thought it'd be great to, you know, put in a, something like a new tree so that, you know, as he grows up, he'll be able to 
see the tree grow up as well. And the way we've got it now, he can actually, he'll actually be able to look out and see it from his bedroom window. And I guess in terms of how I'm feeling, fatherhood is huge. As this, you know, opportunity, this if this responsibility, I absolutely want to get this right and do right by him. And I'm reading a lot of books on uh, fatherhood. I expect that I will be probably reading several per year for a good long while. Hoping that at least some of the good advice soaks in. And I feel like you know, we're, we're doing okay. And there's a challenge, I think, in, in being a first-time dad past 40. Though there's also opportunity. I feel, uh, you know, I think on a positive side that we're definitely a lot uh, better off financially than we were 10 years ago. We're going to be able to, you know, provide a lot better but on the same token, I don't have quite the same energy I had 10 years ago. And that can be a challenge when you're, you know, dealing with a house with a newborn, a dog, and a cat. Prayers are always appreciated. I hope we did not cross the line into TMI. But I also uh, want to acknowledge everyone who sent along cards. We even got a quilt from uh, one listener uh, in and, you know, best wishes on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook it was really great. I appreciate everyone's uh, kind thoughts. I just wanted to be sure everybody who was interested would get an update. And those who weren't could just fast forward or move on to the next uh, program. All right, listener uh, comments and feedback now. And uh, we go over to Twitter and... Uh, I made a uh, comment on uh, John One and how I thought his take on Johnny Dollar was underrated. Bernard says, uh, my favorite of the first four. Haven't reached uh, Reddick and Kramer yet. I read one person call him joyless, but he is very sharply uh, funny every episode. He is class. Well, thanks so much, Bernard. And I definitely agree. I think that he's doing a good job, uh, particularly dealing with, you know, Blake Edwards' scripts. And Blake Edwards wrote a lot more jokes in than, I think, other early Johnny Dollar writers, other than perhaps uh, Gil Dowd. But definitely more than someone like E. Jack Newman. And now that they've got scripts that really do seem to suit Lund better, he's just really rolling with some, you know, great delivery and having a good time. It's and then I received an email from Robert, uh, who writes in, uh, we have been fans of Johnny Dollar many years, and we are very happy uh, to have found your app for iPad. And the subject from the message is, hello from Switzerland. Well, thank you so much, Robert. I appreciate it. And I always love to hear from listeners, but particularly from listeners in places where I don't get downloads from, typically. And certainly Switzerland is one of those countries. About 81% of downloads are from the United States, 10 or 11% from Canada. And when you add in uh, downloads from United Kingdom and Australia, that's about 96% of our total downloads. So it's always fun to hear from people, you know, in the other 4%. And where in the world this podcast does get to. So uh, again, thanks so much for listening, Robert, and so glad that uh, we can provide you Johnny Dollar on your uh, Apple device. Now, it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Maggie, Patreon supporter since September 2016, currently supporting us at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Well, that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. We'll be back next Friday with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But join us back here tomorrow for Tales of the Texas Rangers, where... It is 1.10 a.m., May 17th, 1948. The highway across a barren and thinly populated portion of West Texas is deserted. Except for a truck and trailer pushing steadily westward toward El Paso. Oh, mm. oh, boy, that 
That felt good. You sure were snoring. I could barely hear the motor. How long was I asleep? Since 8 o'clock last night. Almost 1 a.m. now. <sighs> How are we doing? Yeah, we'll be in El Paso by 6. We're right on schedule. You want me to take the wheel? No. no. Wait till we gas up at Frito Junction. It's only another 50 miles. Okay. Nothing you'll ever have will mean as much to you as your young'uns. <laughs> I've been worrying about mine already, and she... He... <laughs> well, whatever it is, ain't even here yet. I keep wondering if I'll be able to make it. You know, bring them up, educate them, help them to be somebody. Yeah, that's something else you'll worry about with each new one. Man, I'm so scared now, I think I'll just settle for one kid and leave it at that. <laughs> that's what I said 12 years ago with our first, but you'll change your mind. Yeah, I guess so. Mary says that she hey, wants... Hey, hey, Huh? What's that ahead? Where? Oh, somebody waving a red lantern. We must be coming to that narrow bridge over Lannan's Creek. You suppose it's been washed out again by a flash flood? Yeah, it could be, although it don't look like there's been any rain here since we started the haul east four days ago. Just the same, they got it blocked. Yeah. Look, Grover, they put up a detour sign. Yeah, probably wants us to go to the left end of the old road. No, sign points to the right, and the fellow with the lantern is waving us that way. Yeah, I guess he knows what he's doing. Don't look like much of a road this way, does it? Oh, it's... Gonna be mighty rough going. I hope this don't last too. Hey, this ain't even a road. Oh, it's just a little dead end turnoff. That guy must have been crazy sending us in here. Backing this rig out is sure gonna be a job. Ah, what a dumb trick. I'm gonna walk back and ask him what in the name of blazes made him turn us off this way. I'll come with you. You'd think they'd have a highway patrol car station there to. Wait a minute. What's the matter? By the road. The guy with the lamp is moving that detour sign. Get back in the truck, quick. What is it, Grover? What's wrong? It's like a hijack. Get it rolling backwards and don't mind what you hit. Just keep going. Grover! Grover! Hey, don't shoot anymore! Don't shoot! He's hurt! You can take it! Uh, I said you could take everything. You didn't have... Mary! Mary! My kid... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.